jump to a comment you made in a recent fireside uh, when you brought up the question. Uh, I think how you phrased it was something about um, why don't people talk about um, um, Putin's uh, rise to power and, and uh, this um, what I would call a fake flag or false flag operation um, where he blew up this apartment building or the FSB or somebody killing his own people and calling it Chechens. Is that something that you talk about? Yeah, I feel very strongly that there's, it's an important about part of understanding this rather brutal figure. The evidence points very strongly, and this isn't just some right-wing nut argument. It, I think, um, I'm trying to remember the woman's name, uh, she was quoting John Dunlop at some length, but an article in the New York Review of Books a few years ago that said, it's really pretty conclusive that those apartment building bombings that took place in 1999, I think in Moscow, killed hundreds of Russians, were blamed, was blamed on the Chechens, but that it was an FSB operation. And the evidence for it is pretty strong. There was an incident in the, uh, what do you call it, in a, in a city called Ryazan, not, um, I, still a pretty big city, I think, but out well outside Moscow, where supposedly alert apartment dwellers stopped some men who were carrying in large sacks of white powder and putting them in the apartment building, were later tested by some security authorities and turned out to be Pemex and explosive. And then the FSB put out the line that no, no, this was just, uh, this was just sh bags of sugar. And they were just testing the vigilance of the apartment dwellers. And one political party, the Yabloko, the one that belonged to Yablinsky, actually tried to take this on in parliament and were shouted down by Putin's thugs. And Litvinenko wrote a whole book about it. And this was dangerous enough for Putin to send his agents to London to poison him with polonium. And I guess the thought was he would die before people figured out what had done it. But once it turned out that it was polonium, it was pretty obvious that it was a KGB operation and not some accident that happened in the tea at, in the hotel. So I, the point of this is that Putin rose to power by virtue of demonstrating his manhood in crushing the Chechens. In 1996, the Chechen, first Chechen war was negotiated by a very tough general whom I actually had met. He told us when we visited with Cheney that he used to like in Afghanistan going hunting antelopes with hand grenades. So, you know, what kind? he, he wasn't exactly a member of uh, peace now, but he went to Chechnya. He negotiated a very generous settlement with the Chechens, end of the first Chechen war. Four years later, two years later, he dies in a helicopter accident. Maybe it was an accident. I don't think, and anyway, the FBI didn't check it out. I can tell you that. And then four years after the first one has ended, Putin rides to power saying the Chechens have just blown up these apartment buildings in Russia and we're gonna punish them for it. And he turns loose this bunch called Kadyrov and his killers, another mafia gang. And these Kadyrovsky and the Russian army level with the capital of Chechnya, Grozny. And I don't know the numbers killed, but it was quite brutal. And the Kadyrovsky are now part of the Russian operation in Ukraine. Yeah, I was going to say they're that. obviously there to kill people. Right. That's the only thing they seem to be good at. You think Ukraine wound up looking like Chechnya did? It's too big to do that, I think. I mean, no, I don't think so. But um, right. uh, that, that may be a little more selective, for example, uh, targeted executions, targeted sniping. Uh, but they, they're already hurting badly. And that's, I think, a big part of this operation, a big part of the, the goal for Putin. I might be wrong. I hope I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. But I think it's about a lot more than bringing Ukraine back into the, so, into, into the Russian fold. It, you know, it fits. And it's certainly about more than NATO enlargement. By the way, General Levitt, when he visited Washington as a retired general in general the special forces of, of the former Soviet Union. Zbigniew Brzezinski hosted a small dinner for him that I attended and someone asked General Levitt, uh, what do you think about NATO enlargement? 
And Lebed said, oh, I'm not afraid of NATO enlargement. NATO is not going to invade Russia. But yeah. right now, today, 4 million Chinese are invading the Russian Far East. So it made a huge difference to get rid of Lebed and to bring this mafia killer in charge of the country. And it's maybe ma I'm overusing the mafia word, but he's certainly a KGB killer. That's what he was trained to do. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I've, I've always called Russia a kleptocracy. Um, you know, when the KGB was alive and they were running the black market in Russia, that was the economy. That was the real economy, I think. And then when, when you know, the, the change came, call it that, um, and the FSB replaced the KGB on some level, um, a lot of those KGB people went around the world and, and formed this amazing network of, of theft and, and drug smuggling and car theft, all kinds of stuff. And I, I think of that as, as an important part of their current economy. I think you're absolutely right. And I think China's the same thing on a larger scale. Yeah, right. And uh, you remember that controversy we had here? I guess it was the 2008 election when um, somebody said, I built my business. And Obama said, you didn't build your business. The government built it for you or something like that. Uh, it's not true. It's, the government doesn't build people's businesses here, but in China and Russia, they make and break them. You don't become a billionaire without the permission of the state. And if you cross a line, you can go to jail for life or even be executed. Right. It's, it's, the, the, the behavior of, of, of Putin's armies and air force in Syria, I think is also exemplary of what we're seeing now so far. And I've, I wondered at the time how, you know, how what you might call a civilized nation, maybe we shouldn't call them a civilized nation, but how a modern country could come in at Assad's request and bomb the living daylights literally out of the civilian population of towns, creating millions of refugees that then flooded into Europe, mostly. And it didn't make sense. They're bombing hospitals and schools, and apartment buildings. It looked like Beirut, you know, and... Like, what's, what's the point? I, are you fighting a military war? Or are you just destroying this part of the country of, of Syria? Is what it looked like to me. And the only point that could make, that made, other than them getting a, a, a nice new seaport out of it, the, the only thing that made sense to me was driving these immigrants into the heart of NATO and Europe was brilliant. And it created the end of, of Angela Merkel's power, for one, I think. And, and a lot of troubles throughout all of Europe, um, not because these weren't nice people, but just because, you know, they're all Islamic, basically, and they're, they're going to be different than the guys where they, you know, Sweden. Yeah. yeah, and just that pressure of that percentage of people coming in is going to create a lot of, and I'll just add, I, I am convinced that Putin completely despises Islam and Islamists, so all the stands around the edge of Russia are objects of hate, I think, of his, so um, it just seemed interesting, you know, that maybe there was an ulterior motive to this civilian bombing in Syria, as thuggish as it was. That's an interesting hypothesis. I hadn't thought about that before, but um, certainly he produced that result and it was certainly destabilizing in Europe. Yeah. And now I'm reading that maybe there are a million refugees out of Ukraine and it's only just started. Yeah. And talk about destabilization, even though they speak a Slavic language and have a lot of sympathy from local populations. We know how quickly that disappears when neighborhoods get transformed. And I mean, we we see it here in the United States, but not on the not I, 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 being foolish and saying not on that scale, but it's a pretty enormous scale. Right. And I think I also think again he, like other dic fellow dictators, didn't like seeing the idea of Assad being hanging by his ankles the way Mussolini did. So it was in his personal interest to stop, to protect Assad and to preserve him. Right. And well, he saw weakness in the Western response. Yes, absolutely. It's unfortunately what Xi Jinping is seeing now. Exactly, the red line. When, when Obama said there's a red line on chemicals, chemical use, and then he didn't do anything about it, many people feel as though that was a gigantic mistake. There were two red lines, Mark. People forget that he said before that Assad must go. When I last checked, he hadn't gone. Yeah. Obama wasn't there, but Assad was gone. Yeah, right. Like Saddam liked to say, Bush is gone and Thatcher are gone. 
is gone, but I'm here. Yeah. Which reminds me, you and I are old enough to remember 1990 when Saddam invaded Kuwait. Yep. We went to war in defense of Kuwait. More than in defense, we went to war to liberate Kuwait because we wouldn't accept the idea that in the 20th century, aggression could go unpunished. Well, here we are 30 years later and what's happening. Yeah. It's, it's a terrible reversal. And I think people get too abstract when they talk about the end of the, what is it, the, the famous phrase, the, the liberal international order. I mean, that's such an abstraction, I think, to most Americans. But if they understand aggression across borders, if they understand the way the Americans responded in 1950 when Korea was invaded. That's just not an acceptable world. It's not good for Americans to live in a world where that kind of thing happens. And I'm afraid we're heading for that kind of world to a greater extent than I would like to see. I think that Americans have the blessing and luxury of, uh, the, you know, this the water on both sides. And um, with, with the result that it, it doesn't take long for us to forget World War II or you know, other things like you're mentioning. And you know, our, my, my dad remembered, but I hadn't been through it. And so um, um, I remember saying once to some, one of my dad's friends, uh, I understand that because I hadn't been through the two most important events of your life, I'll never understand the world the way you do. He said, what are those? I said, World War II and the depression. And he said, yeah, you're absolutely right. And I think, you know, it's hard. I know Evan and I in working on the China issue uh, we were warned that American corporations would be our biggest enemies, and they have been, these global companies that don't have any country. And I keep saying to them, the Chinese companies are clear that they do have a country. Uh, but and if they ever forget it, they'll pay a price for them. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, it's hard for Americans, as, I think as nice as we are, in a way, to get our arms around the bad behavior of someone like Putin or even or someone like Xi. It's just hard for them to conceive of someone who is either evil or cl so close to it, you can't discern the difference. Um, it's just hard for them to believe it. They want to believe that we're all in this together and we're not. Can I give you an example? Sure. When I start to talk to people about Saddam Hussein, and one of the things I say is this man invented punishments that are worse than death. And one reaction I get is, well, what could possibly be worse than death? And I said, well, how about watching your children being thrown in boiling oil or getting a videotape of your wife or your daughter being raped? Oh, well, that's what you mean. They never heard of this sort of thing, but people who grow up in that environment are constantly fearful. They live in awareness that anything you say on the phone might end up being used against you. Right. What is correct this year may be criminal the next year. Right. And right. we have no concept of that. A friend of mine said to me just today, actually, the millennial generation was born on third base. I hadn't heard that expression before, but I know exactly what he means. Well, one of them this morning in, in the uh, conversation about uh, Ukraine, um, pretty young guy, he said, the question came up, why are they not taking down the communications? And he said, ah, they, they're using them to listen to everybody talk. And they wanna know who's whom and what they're saying so that when they get in there, they know exactly where to go. Mm -hmm. And I thought that's pretty, that's pretty smart. Um, Unfortunately. Yeah. Well, let's do a jump here for a minute, if you don't mind, uh, over to China. We've kind of touched on it. Um, when, when Xi came to power, um, I had a, a friend who's now passed away, Sidney Rittenberg, who many people from FIRE used to know. And um, I have no doubt that, well, I know Sidney was helping with a propaganda effort for the Communist Party. He told me all about it. Uh, he, he resigned from the party later, but that's what his, when he was released from 16 years in solitary, that was the job they gave him, and he took it. Uh, so, um, I think almost anything at a point is, yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, um, but when, when Xi became, uh, took power, he and I had dinner, and he said, don't worry about Xi, he's, he's a good guy, I know his family, they're good people, it's all going to be fine. And I said, I don't agree with you for two reasons. One is uh, he changed the Politburo to be majority military for the first time in history. That's a bad idea. And the other is that um, the standing committee. And the other is that, that uh, his first speech, as soon as he gained power, was to a military camp, not to a civilian group. And that's a bad sign. 
And I feel as though all of that has played out perfectly. He is exactly the guy I was afraid he was going to be. Now, you, what are your thoughts about this guy? Well, the thing that one of the things that has struck me about him um, was when they published the so-called new short history of the Chinese Communist Party at, back about, I guess it was mid middle of last year in anticipation of the what 75th anniversary. I keep lose track of these anniversaries. But anyway, big deal thing with lots of Xi Jinping's new thought for a new century. Um, there were some very striking contrast with the 1980 previous history that was basically written under Deng Xiaoping's direction that was full of criticisms of Mao Zedong for staying too long, abolishing term limits, creating a cult of personality, um, persecuting ethnic minorities, and there are probably one or two other things. And what is very striking is if you compare these specific criticisms of Mao with what Xi Jinping says about Mao, which is a sort of watered down criticism of the Cultural Revolution, none of these other things that apply to people who want to stay on power for life are there. In other words, he wants to remove all the guardrails. He started doing this actually very early with something called document number nine, which denounced the idea of what he called historical nihilism. And historical nihilism is any serious criticism of the history of the Chinese Communist Party. And people say correctly that among Soviet leaders, he hates Gorbachev, particularly because he showed the way to collapse the communist system. But he reserves, I think, almost as much venom for Nikita Khrushchev for exposing the crimes of the Stalin era. And that's historical nihilism to criticize the, Chinese, the Soviet Communist Party. And correspondingly, you got a whitewash Mao. So he has laid the foundations for staying forever, of course, forever is until you die at, at the latest. Right. And I think you know, I've dealt a little bit with several dictators who thought they could stay forever. Marcos in the Philippines, Suharto in Indonesia, um, um, Najib in, in Malaysia. None of them made it, but something starts to happen as they get older. Uh, there's a sort of decline of the regime that is partly biological and it's partly political. The biological part, I think, comes from the fact that they, the people around them are now a generation younger. And I remember one of Suharto's deposed generals who had the temerity to criticize Suharto's kids to his face once said to me that the new head of the army had once used to be Suharto's adjutant and held the car door for him to serve him our juice. He's never going to tell the truth to Suharto. And I think we're not at that point, although maybe we are, but as these guys get older, um, the people they rely on are gonna be much, much younger. And I think that has its impact. But the other thing that happens, and I believe this is what happened in the Cultural Revolution, is there begins to be an anticipation of when the dictator's gonna go and people just start to place their bets. And what Mao wanted to do was keep things sufficiently disordered Yes. that nobody could organize to get rid of him prematurely. Yeah, yeah right. And uh, the result was thousands of Chinese died. Millions. Um, million, well, in the Cultural Revolution, it's probably in the tens of thousands. I, numbers yeah, okay. aren't very clear on that one. 70 million over, over all of Mao's crimes, yep. Well, so you had, I mean, here's another one of your, their posts that we cut and, we cut and pasted. Um, and it's along these lines. So I want to ask you the Did I question. Say this? <laughs> okay, go on. Sorry. You said, so what is the pattern? Words back at you. There you go. What is the pattern of what happens near the end of dictators for life? And I think where you were going, what it felt to me like where you were going was that was kind of the biological slash legacy um, question of whether people do things that are more desperate when they're nearing the end of their, their lives. And the people around them start doing more chaotic things. And by right. the way, I, you could add Egypt to that list. I think part of what brought Mubarak down was a lot of unhappiness in the military, actually, that his son was being groomed to take over and the military didn't, they were prepared to accept Mubarak as dictator, but not his son. 
Right. So um, you're saying, does do they start to back into a corner and get more brutal? It's, uh, I think, I'd hesitate to generalize. Mao got more brutal. Marcos, in the end, accepted exile in the United States. Uh, I don't think there's a rule, but I, I guess they start to confront it's either slaughter or die, I suppose, it's slaughter or, or, or be slaughtered. It becomes uh, a very difficult choice for them. And even if you offer them a comfortable exile in Hawaii, it's not everyone that will take that choice. Does it seem to you as though people who are... By the way, <laughs> let me say on that point, the late Mike Mansfield, who was our ambassador to Japan, once said to a friend of mine that he knew Marcos and he didn't think at the end of the day that Marcos would massacre, massacre his own, the mass, I hate this term, his own people, massacre Filipinos. And when we say that Xi Jinping mistreats his own people, they're not his people, they're his subjects, which is why I would like to say, don't say the word China without qualifying it. There's the China of the Chinese people, which has a great historical tradition. Some of it is, of course, brutal and cruel, but it's a great achievement in many ways, and so are their recent achievements. Then there's the China, the Chinese Communist Party, which is probably not going to go away in your or my lifetime. I hope it does, but I wouldn't bet on it. And then finally, there's the China of Xi Jinping, and I think a lot of what we're dealing with here is very unique to Xi Jinping and the backward turning of the clock that he decided on. And I. If I can speculate here, um, and not monopolizing too much time, I, it's puzzling to me, I've puzzled a lot over how can a man whose father was humiliated in the Cultural Revolution and whose mother was forced to denounce his father, I believe, and he, Xi Jinping, was sent down to the countryside, deprived of a decent education, although a lot of people who know him well say he wasn't really up to a decent education, that he's not that bright. I don't know, I have no idea where they get that from, but I've heard that from Chinese. Um, how can he turn around and criticize historical nihilism that criticize the act of criticizing Mao Zedong? And the only conclusion I can come to is a kind of uh, sorry, it's turn off the phone. Um, a kind of well, I was humiliated. My father was humiliated, but I'm going to show them. And I'm going to be the most powerful ruler China's ever had, ever had. He aspires to be more powerful than the Emperor Qin Shi Huang Di, whom Mao glorified for, um, what was it, burning books and burying scholars alive by the thousands. Uh, this is a country, I talked about Chinese traditions, some of them are not so pretty. And I think Xi Jinping believes that if he can rule forever, take Taiwan, subject the United States to second class status that he will go down in history the way Napoleon hoped to go down in history. And I hope he goes down in history the way Napoleon did, but that hasn't happened yet. I have a question for you. Um, recently, I was in a quite long conversation with a friend up here and um, a smart guy, and he was making an argument that I didn't accept. His argument was things would be fine because look at the stability of Chinese history, they're, they're 5,000, 1,000, however many thousand you want to throw out there, years of history, and you know, look at, look at that country over that span of time. And I said, I, I don't, I'm not accepting that. I'm looking at that country since the communists took over. And I believe we're seeing not 5,000 years of stability, but 100 years of instability. And that this is a very unstable situation right now. It's economically unstable. It's politically unstable. The whole thing is a house of cards. And it's just the opposite of, of the longer reflection of their history. Do you have a thought about that? I guess, first of all, I think it's a romanticism of the earlier history to suggest that it produced stability. <laughs> all right. It was stability of constant wars and constant conquest. And they didn't grow from the Manchu kingdom to, to a great empire through a stable process any more than the Duchy of Moscow, well, Muscovy did. So um, I think it was Richard Pipes who liked to cite starting, I think the year he fixed was 1645. I'm not sure about this part. At any rate, that every year on average over the next several centuries, 
Mos the Duchy of Moscovy added an area the size of the Netherlands to its empire. And on the grounds that they had to suppress these border areas for security, sake of security. So I, I think it's, as I say, I don't think it was that great before, but I think number one, it's not in much doubt that the Chinese communists have very deliberately de destroyed much of Chinese culture. Even the cuisine, they say, is better in Taiwan than on the mainland because the, the good chefs were labels, reactionaries. Um, they came from the wrong class. The extent to which, and this red roulette book makes it very clear, you, you get labeled as from the wrong class and you never get a job um, or you never get a decent job. It's a system of apartheid and it's hereditary. I want to so, ask you, um, Go ahead. sorry. Um, but I do agree with you that I think this, the, the stability that they show on the surface is more surface stability. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the contrast between what they boast of and what they are underneath, I do think tends to more aggressive behavior. And I worry that even though I don't think she is as reckless as Putin, Putin may be showing the way that you can be pretty reckless and get away with it and that's not good yeah i worry about that too so i've got a couple of quick questions for you um we're coming up um on um a time when we're going to open up for question and answer uh, about seven minutes from now um one is very quick how many people do you think were murdered in tiananmen square um well first of all nobody kept count um I think bodies were burned and hustled away. And it wasn't just in Beijing, by the way, the massacres took place elsewhere too. Hmm. Um, the guesses that I've heard people tell me are maybe 10,000, maybe 11,000, but in the thousands. That's what I've heard. And that's a lot. Yeah, that's what I've heard too. And often you hear like a hundred, but I, th I think you're right. Um, okay, here's another question, which is a very provocative, it's my turn to be provocative. Um, um, if you look at the culture of China and you look at what has happened to Tibet, for instance, where Han Chinese were shipped in to replace um, the local business people and where the churches were burned and so forth, Tibetan temples were burned. And, um, now it's the Uyghurs. But I'm, I, I wonder, there are people, I'm not saying this, I'm reporting on other, I've heard it said, that the Han Chinese consider all others to be inferior racially. That's my provocative statement. And I'm wondering if, and, and the Uyghur concentration camps would tend to underline that view. Um, is, it, what, is it your perspective that Xi Jinping himself is a racist? Let me be a little bit cautious with my answer. It would not surprise me at all to discover that he thinks he's superior, not only to non-Han Asians, but to everybody, all, including the round-eyed Westerners, including the United States. And the more we display, I mean, that's another thing that is worth mentioning about both Xi and Putin. Um, in this not very good movie, if I, that's not a good way to start it, but there's a very exciting movie called Munich. And it has takes some liberties with history, according to what Andrew Roberts wrote about it. But anyway, I think it's accurate in saying that Hitler prided himself on reading people's faces. And he read when he could read, he could read fear when it was there. And they're like bloodhounds that smell fear. And the big test for them is whether people are reacting fearfully or not. And I think, um, I'm sorry, this, I'm digressing though. Your question was about she and his sense of racial superiority. I, I guess what I'm saying is I think first of all, he probably considers himself superior to most people. But I certainly think that there's, when he deals with Westerners and smells that they're weak, he says, oh yeah, you guys were fine at bullying China when you, started the opium war, but you're not gonna do that crap again. And there is definitely a, and look, 
the opium war was pretty shocking. If you think about going to war to force a country to open its drug market, which is what it basically was about. But um, uh, they know that we're made of, we're not made of the same stuff any longer. Right. We're about to come to the five minute uh, Sterner gun, Ender gun, where five minutes from now, you and I will complete and we'll ask, let, let uh, the audience ask questions of you. Quick um, interruption. Go ahead. Yeah, I, for the record, I think it's very important to state because I'm sure some listeners who aren't already persuaded of your, persuaded of your view or my view are gonna say, oh, what a pair of warmongers these people are. They are gonna have us going to war with China. Hmm. And I wanna state emphatically that I think a war with China would be terrible and really must be avoided by whatever means we can manage to avoid it. But I don't believe it's avoided by showing weakness avoided by giving up. And if you need a good example, there's one right in front of your face in Asia where the Soviet records are absolutely clear that Stalin refused to approve the North Korean invasion of the South until he began to get evidence that the Americans would do nothing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, yeah. that worries yeah. me for the peace of the world. I, I agree with you on both counts. and. Uh... You know, we're already on the record uh, with regard to China that they neither do they want a, a military war. They would, from Sun Tzu's perspective, that would be a, a bad move. They would rather win the economic war without a shot fired. And so far, it's working. Why screw it up? Um, but um, very different I, from Putin in that respect. Yeah. 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 Um, so uh, I want to jump to Taiwan for a minute and then go to what we call crank. But you're you obviously you're interested in Taiwan. You're running this council. Um, how do you feel about the likelihood? And you can include Ukraine in your answer if you want to. Uh, that that there will be an attack on Taiwan. Uh, small correction, just to be clear. I retired as chairman, I believe, when I took a chairmanship of a State Department advisory board. Um, okay. So I'm no longer chairman. Um, it's got a very good tech guy who's now running it, which is appropriate because Taiwan is such an important source of, of microprocessor technology for us. And that's part of the picture, too. Um, I guess I worry on both counts. I worry that, that Xi Jinping might attempt a full-scale attack on Taiwan to, quote, liberate it. It's shocking to call this. I mean, Putin is liberating Ukraine. Give me a break, please. Um, but I, in some ways, do worry more that he'll just wear them down, that they'll get tired of these constant threats of war, constant um, intrusions into their airspace, and begin to weaken. Certainly, that's what it would seem. I, certainly, it's not a good word to use. A lot of this is guesses, to be fair. But one guesses that all of these rather provocative actions around Taiwan's airspace are meant to weaken their will. But if anything, they're just reminding them of be careful, you'll see the fate, suffer the same fate as Hong Kong. And, you know, if anyone has destroyed the notion of one China, it's Xi Jinping by destroying Hong Kong and ripping up the agreement that he made with the British. And I don't think our leadership reminds Americans enough that there was an agreement with the Russians in 1994, I think it was, or 96, the Budapest Agreement, in which the Ukrainians, in return for giving up their the Soviet nuclear weapons on their territory, uh, got a guarantee and assurance of Ukrainian security and independence from the US and the UK and Russia, not just us. And in parallel, when um, Nixon had the first communique with China, and then there was the normalization communique, and then there was a third one that Reagan reluctantly concluded to limit arms sales. All of those were conditioned on China pursuing a peaceful approach to Taiwan, and they've done anything but pursued a peaceful approach. Peaceful approach doesn't include buzzing their airspace, threatening war. That's the threat of force is the prelude to the use of force, and we saw that we've just seen that in Ukraine. And I think we need to start calling them on that and start saying, you know, we made some deals and we were prepared to live by them, but you didn't. And now it's time to get much more serious about deterrence. And 
and by the way, not so incidentally, Japan has come, the Jap, senior Japanese officials and one former deputy prime minister named Aso have come out. Oh, and more importantly, the recent prime minister, Shinzo Abe, have come out saying Taiwan is part of Japan's security. And we should be engaging them much more strongly in, in figuring out how we can work together to deter that. So I think a part of my answer to your question would be the likelihood depends on many things. And it doesn't just depend on whether who they think is going to win. And it's not even clear what winning would mean. I think, uh, you know, God forbid, well, first of all, it's a pretty dangerous thing to, for two nuclear powers to fight any kind of war with one another. And if Xi Jinping thinks he can predict how it goes, then he's more of a genius than I think he is. And it's certainly, I wouldn't dare to predict it. I, that's one of the things that worries me. But I would also just worry, and I would worry if I were in his shoes, that it could be a very long, not necessarily open war, but it could be a very long confrontation that went very deep into the roots of their economy and the control they have over the United States would begin to weaken and the control that he has over his own people. It's a risky business to start a very big war as the Russian czars found out and as Hitler found out. So. I think Xi Jinping should be reminded that it's not going to be a walk through, walk through the park. All right. Well, that's a perfect answer. Thank you very much. And thank you for this entire conversation. I have found it very interesting. I hope everybody else has. And I'm now going to turn over my stewardship. Uh, I think we have a master of ceremonies lurking somewhere. Yes, I'm ready. Here I'm here. I'm ready right. to... So, Paul, we have a lot of questions for you, a lot of chatter going on in the chat during this session. Um, Peter Schwartz had the first question, and he said, Jim Stavridi said that Putin is seeking to rebuild the Russian empire, means he is not headed toward Western Europe. Next step is Moldova, then Kazakhstan. Do you agree? Um, I think the, well, He's already intervened in Kazakhstan, and if I were in Moldova, I'd worry a lot. Um, I think the immediately bordering areas are obviously the first victims, and and the Baltic states obviously present a particular challenge because they're now all members of NATO as well. And I don't think we've thought through very clearly what happens to NATO's security guarantees if, in fact, he goes after. Lithuania, Latvia, and, and or Estonia. So I would add them to any list of immediate worries. I, you know, the Russian empire, except under the, the Soviets never extended much beyond the midline of Poland, which they agreed on with Hitler of all people. Um, and the, the threat to Western Europe always not always. I mean, there was always a sense that there might be a military conquest of Western Europe. But the other th danger is what was called Finlandization, which is to say a fear of Russian power. And in the case of Finland, which gets unfairly denigrated with that label, the Finns were pretty tough. So the Rus Russians didn't want to, the Soviets didn't want to tackle them militarily again. But they were able to do things like prevent the publication of social needs in books in Finland. That's a big infringement on individual liberty. And we're seeing, unfortunately, quite a bit of that in the United States with the exercise of Chinese economic power. There's a lot of censorship now that goes on because of that. All right, the next question is from Josh Rogan, who says, question for Dr. Wolfowitz, who was the tall man in the Bush administration who had the Napoleon complex? and who called it out? Please name names. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the man who called it out is Larry Eagleburger. Uh, I need to check on the other name. And <laughs> if he's still around, I don't think it's fair to name him. But everyone in the State Department could tell you. He ran Latin American Affairs, how's that sound? Getting pretty close. All right. Um, let's see, Mary Branscombe asks, I recently saw a theory that the Salisbury poisoning was deliberately public and easy to attribute to Russia. And it hit my weird conspiracy theory buttons. But is that the kind of public 
demonstration that fits with Putin's behavior? Um, I guess I'm, my sense, it, it very well could be, but it also, I thought I read assessments and I haven't read Lyanko's book, which I really now must do, that somehow it was thought that it would be difficult to diagnose and therefore he would die of something that didn't look like poisoning and wouldn't be traced right back to where he drank the poison tea. But it, uh, the more I think about the question, it does seem as though if you really wanted to cover your tracks, aren't there simpler poisons to put in tea? It couldn't be traced. I mean, I mean, it's not every poisoner that goes around with polonium. Let's put it that way. Eric, can I jump on that for a minute? Sure. There's a pattern here, Paul, and that's my favorite business. Um, and the pattern is uh, of of being obvious. So, I believe that Mary's right, and that the use of Novichok as an example, which is a military grade uh, poison, is very almost impossible that a civilian would get his or her hands on it. And so they've used that two or three times. Uh, so you, you're absolutely sure if you're a, a British or American, whatever, that this was uh, Putin himself approving a, a kill in London or in Salisbury. And um, I think polonium is in the same category, even back to the uh, umbrella stabbings uh, and so on. Um, I think that these killings are trying to send a message to people worldwide. You can't get away from Putin. And, and that by signing it with, with military grade poisons or weaponry, um, that message is loud and clear. I, I don't know. I have to say that sounds more convincing than what I was saying. So <laughs> I'll get you that one. But All right. I suppose in the same category, when Yemsov is murdered with a gunshot in the back of, in his back, I believe, it's done right under the walls of the Kremlin. So it's almost by a, it's almost deliberately attributable. Absolutely. Yeah. So there was, a, there was a bit of chatter, <laughs> just as a point of clarification, because we uh, make, like to make sure that we are being as accurate as possible here. There was some chatter in the chat about the Obama quote you referenced. And the actual quote was, as, as found by Rennie Gleason during this conversation, the point is, is that when we succeed, we succeed because of our individual initiative, but also because we do things together. Um, the next question. Sorry, which quote did I reference? I'm lost. Uh, a question. You, the quote about him saying you didn't build your company. You know. Your, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, but so, I, excuse me. I take it that the quote that is being offered in counter is about something entirely different. No. No, it was debunked specifically in an article about it by fact check. Okay. So that's he didn't why, say that's, that. In other words. Yeah, he didn't actually say the quote that you mentioned. Apparently. Okay. To okay. I'd love to see it. Thank you. Yeah. So um, I'm being corrected. It's helpful. <laughs> Dan Patton says, what are Putin's motives for invading Ukraine? Rebuilding Russia? Stopping NATO expansion? Other reasons which you alluded to but did not expand upon? I think it's to strengthen his hold on power in Russia itself and remove an example of Slavic peoples managing democracy, most of all the example of Slavic peoples expelling corrupt dictators. Uh, so I think it's got more to do with destroying the example of Ukraine and punishing the Ukrainians for daring. But look, we don't have him on the couch to analyze him. So all of this is speculation. But by, I, let me just say this, I think that um, I think that if it was the threat of so-called threat of NATO membership, I would say number one, as General Levitt said, NATO's not going to invade Russia. And I think Putin, Putin is smart enough to know that. But I think in fact, if he had mobilized all these troops and threatened an invasion and then said, okay, let's agree on something like what, believe it or not, Nikita Khrushchev agreed to for Austria in 1954, the Austrian State Treaty, where the Soviet Union and I believe all three Western powers, maybe it was just the United States and the UK, 
agreed to guarantee to a neutral Austria that would not be allied with either the Soviet Union or the United States. And that treaty held throughout the Cold War. And of course, it's, it's and I, don't, I don't know if it's legally in effect now, but it, it was possible. I guess what I'm saying is if that were his motive, there are many different ways to go about achieving it. And this attack was absolutely unnecessary and brutal and horrible. And okay. sorry. No, go ahead. I could go on. Um, I, we I am just so reminded. Here, so I... <laughs> sorry, I, I'm going to. Let's just remember we went to war, sent 400,000 American troops to Saudi Arabia in 1990 to liberate Kuwait and to establish the principle that nuclear powers can't go and invade, not nuclear powers, that countries in, in this age can't simply subjugate others through force. And we did it for, it lasted for a couple of decades, but it hasn't lasted now. All right, one so, more? Yeah, the question, I'll go, I'll go to one, which is the topic of hybrid warfare, which we've advertised this session to be about. Uh, Rennie Gleason asks, on the topic of hybrid warfare, Russia's next generation warfare document proposed exactly the kind of warfare waged in Crimea and attempted in Ukraine. How do you rate US hybrid warfare capabilities? Info ops, property, it, etc. It's an awfully broad term, and part of what it brings in, which I think is important and is new, is the cyber dimension, which really hasn't been, unless you want to say the Trojan horse is a kind of cyber act, penetration of the ancient Greeks, uh, but it's more important. I mean, cyber is a dimension of warfare now that we have not dealt with before. And, seems to be an operation to some extent in this conflict, but I think only limited way. And certainly we haven't been affected by it in this crisis. Um, that's a dimension that strikes me as very new. The use in effect of proxies to have so-called deniability is got a longer history. Uh, we've of course done it ourselves in what was called the Reagan doctrine, uh, supporting proxies uh, that were where their interest in opposing the Soviet Union or the Cubans coincided with ours. It seems to me that to the extent that hybrid war is a concept that hopes to describe the goal of winning without fighting, of winning without war, which is one of the elements that comes into some of the descriptions that what we're seeing in Ukraine is almost the complete opposite. It's totally attributable and it's not winning without war, it's winning through pretty violent bloodshed and massacres of civilians. Um, so it's, um, I'm gonna have to plug this in or I'm gonna lose my battery, I'm sorry, just a minute. I think we're at winding up, Paul. Oh, okay, I guess I just go to low power for work, okay. So, Barrett, are we at the, we are. Yes, we are just about out of time. Okay. Thank you, Paul. For thank a very you, Mark. Conversation. Thank you, Barrett. Yeah, thank you.